continuing reading in this book, Escape from Mount Mar Mariah by Jackie Bahar. Today I'll read the A Sabbath Drive. It's the number 12 story in 18. Though my parents were thoroughly Jewish, they could never make up their minds about the practice of religion. Some days they were religious, other days they weren't. One Sabbath it was all right to turn on the lights, the next Sabbath it was a sin. To end the confusion, they decided to send me to a yeshiva. They placed a yarmulke on my head and enrolled me in the Lubavitch yeshiva on Montreal's Park Avenue. Now the Lubavitch, as you may know, are very pious. And thus, over a period of sustained training, I too became pious. Quite the young fanatic. I even became a little tyrant in our home. I began to quiz my father about why he worked on the Sabbath, why he didn't perform the mitzvah of Tefillin every morning, and what about the food? Was it kosher? I mean, really kosher? My parents, in time were not Jewish enough for me. A choice was coming up. Either I leave the house and find parents worthy of my emerging Jewishness, or they pull me out of the yeshiva. One thing above all else I learned in the yeshiva, you can't hide from sin. The Midrash says, Know what is above you, an eye sees, an ear hears, and all your actions are recorded in a book. Our rabbi said, In the time of reckoning, even the walls will testify against you, and so will your angels, and even your soul. I believed this, but not enough. Without knowing it, I put it to the test, just like King David who wrote, Test me, tempt me. And sure enough, God sent him Bathsheba. That summer, we were up in the Laurentian Mountains, spending the weekend in Val Moran with the Stearns, who owned a cottage in the woods. On Friday, I played with Lillian Ster Lilia Stern. I told her Val Moran was nothing to me. I was the toughest guy in town. That evening, she repeated my movie line in the village, in the village square, and that night, twenty of the meanest-looking characters were waiting for me at the bottom of the hill. Well, said Lilia, I went out to meet them, and they fled. I don't know why. I was no match for even a single one of them. But by stepping out, who knew what they imagined? The next day, the Sabbath, I decided to do without Lilia. Instead, I found some green apples and tossed them into the open top window of an empty red barn. When I got tired of that, I went for a very long walk and found myself in a wilderness. I was lost. The more I walked, the deeper was the isolation. Finally, I found a road and waited for the first car. A French-Canadian farmer picked me up. He spoke no English. I spoke no French. So we were even. Somehow, he got me to where I belonged. I made him let me off at the outskirts, so I'd not be seen riding on the Sabbath. I checked around. Nothing but woods. Do trees talk? Absolutely no eyes had seen me. No ears had heard me. There were no walls to testify against me. Surely the French-Canadian would be no witness. He knew nothing of me. And to him, this wasn't even the Sabbath. Back in school, a month or so later, the Rosh Yeshiva headmaster called me in and said he wanted to talk to me and my father. This was never a good sign when they wanted to talk to your father. The only thing I could figure was that he was behind on his payments, if he made any payments at all. 
or that I wasn't doing well enough in my studies. My mon my monades, I wasn't. When I told my father about the summons, he shrugged. He said, "New, new, new." Together we stood before the rabbi, and this was what the rabbi said: "Your son is being expelled. He was seen riding on the Sabbath." When was this? My father asked. The rabbi wouldn't say. Where was this? Same answer. Who saw him? Asked my father. The rabbi smiled, but that was all. Outside, my father asked me if it were true. I confessed. I told him about my Sabbath drive in Val Moran. You're sure nobody saw you? He asked. I'm sure. Hmm. He said, and we'll move on here today to thirteen. A telegram from Israel. This is another favorite. One day a telegram came. I signed for it since my parents were out. I opened it and read that my father's mother in Israel had died. Gathered, said the message, unto her people at age 102. She had given birth to my father at a very late age, in the tradition of our matriarchs. And what was she, if not a matriarch? My father had spoken of her as of a saint, I thought the news would be unbearable for my father, so I, de I decided not to show him the telegram. I thought it best that he never know about his mother's death. What good, good would it do him to know? I hesitate to call her my grandmother because I never met her, and as far as I knew, she never knew I existed. We were not a close family. My father seldom wrote to her, if ever. But she was a legend in the vein of Sarah, Rebecca, Lee, and Rachel. She had been a woman of biblical beauty and virtue. There was a picture of her seated on a, a bench next to her husband, somewhere in the depths of Poland. He, long gray beard and lively eyes, had the appearance of a prophet. And she, yes, she was the image of a Jewish saint. She was truly a woman of another world, a world that existed no more. I thought by withholding word of her death I would be preserving that world for my father. Enough of his past had collapsed. Why pain him even further? So I kept it a secret for days and weeks and thought to go on like this forever. He'd never know. I thought I was doing a great mitzvah, so nobly keeping the grief to myself. Then, somewhere in my clothes, my mother found the telegram. She asked, What is this? She could not read English, so I told her. I told her everything. And as I explained my reasoning, it occurred, occurred to me that I had done something terrible. I had performed no mitzvah. I had committed a sin. I was overtaken by guilt and fear. This thing that I had done could not be undone. Upon such news, Shiva had to be sat. Kaddish had to be said all at prescribed times. That time was lost. For an instant I thought to enlist my mother in my conspiracy, but I dropped that scheme when I beheld her astonishment. I awaited the scolding, but nothing came. That night I went out to visit a friend. On my way home the heavens opened, 
as though a celestial zipper had rent the sky. From utter darkness came incredible radiance. When I realized what was happening, it was over. Wait, I thought. Wait. Wait. I want to see more. I want to see what's inside. Somebody, it seemed, was showing me something, but I lacked the eyes to see. Was it a sign? This much I knew. It was not lightning. No, much too deliberate. What's more, this was not a flash, but rather a brilliance, showing or wanting to show the answer to every secret. My father had once said that when the world was created, it was 56,000 times brighter than today. God had dimmed the world after the sin of Eve, our first matriarch, and would rekindle the original light when the earth, or perhaps an individual, was deserving. When I got home, my father was in his socks, in belated mourning for his mother. He had been weeping for her, but as for me and my sin, he was sympathetic. He said, you silly child, you should have told me, but you meant well. And what's done is done. I told my father how the heavens had parted, that it had happened on the day he was praying for his mother's soul. I said it must be coincidence. He said there is no such thing. <laughs>